Welcome back to your weekly dose of financial markets microstructure. So last week we wrapped up our discussion of high frequency trading and algorithmic trading. And uh, so the general takeaway from that is that uh, high frequency trading probably brings more bad than good because it uh, creates informational asymmetries uh, from basically nothing. And we know that uh, adverse selection is typically typically impairs market liquidity. But of course, high frequency trading also has its upside. Um, in particular, a lot of liquidity is uh, in the market is actually provided by algo traders and HFTs. Uh, we also talked last week about uh, Condor model which dealt with the effects of public information and seek to explain that public announcements uh, typically generate a lot of trading volumes which was not um, which was not predicted by our very standard basic models in which price adjustments should have happened without any uh, without any actual trading and uh, Connor took a slightly esoteric uh, in terms of theory approach uh, by dealing with higher order beliefs so this is a slightly esoteric in terms of theory but it is a very reasonable approach in terms of uh, intuition so his idea was that when you buy the asset you don't care about the fundamental value so much as you care about the price at which you will get to sell this asset later on and um, which means that you have to form a belief about what other traders will believe about the price of the asset about the value of the asset so any trader had to hold these second order beliefs and uh, by adopting also a somewhat carefully crafted but reasonable information structure he managed to uh, generate this effect he managed to generate this disagreement uh, and in his model my higher private information resulted in uh, lower second-order expectation so basically the more I personally think the asset is worth the less I think you think the asset is worth so that was the idea yesterday and today we will be talking about bubbles bubbles are uh, quite a prominent phenomenon in financial markets I'm pretty sure you can all list a number of examples I'll go through some of the modern classics um, in the next slide but really bubbles are a bit of a puzzle for classical economics so it's not clear it's not 100% clear why they arise so today we'll look at a few models of um, how this kind of bubbles can go so we will look at a class of models called herding models which tell us that you know sometimes agents can ignore their private information and just trade based on the public information that is available which would mean that everyone does the very same thing because nobody listens to their heart and that generates herding and that uh, is the idea behind bubbles and then we will look at another model uh, due to Abru and Brunermeyer and it will have um, part of the same flavor so in that model bubbles will also result from the lack of um, aggregation of private information but that model will also have to deal with um, higher order beliefs so we get two in a row with higher order beliefs that's pretty cool so let's start with attempting to define bubbles so I'm pretty sure you all have an idea of what it is right of what bubbles are how they work but it's a little difficult to maybe put it in words to give a um, proper characterization of what a bubble is so here are a few definitions for you you know Webster dictionary defines bubbles as no but Wikipedia defines bubbles as a trade in high volumes at prices that are considerably at variance with intrinsic values so that are considerably away from intrinsic values so this definition also includes negative bubbles when some assets are very underpriced which I guess is not in the folk definition of a bubble is not included there 
Investopedia defines bubbles as a surge in equity prices, often more than warranted by the fundamentals, and usually in a particular sector, followed by a drastic drop in prices as a massive sell-off occurs. So, in this Investopedia definition, bubble is not a state of the economy, but it describes, uh, this definition describes a path that the economy follows. So it's a surge in prices followed by a drastic drop. But this definition also outlines the disconnect between the price and the fundamentals. Finally, Chicago Fed also has a definition which says that a bubble exists when the market price of an asset exceeds its price determined by fundamental factors by a significant amount for a prolonged period. So, same as Wikipedia definition except with a couple of vague qualifiers. So, significant amount and prolonged period. So these three definitions all have a common denominator, which is prices deviate from the fundamental values. None of these three definitions include um, the behavioral aspect. Uh, wh what I mean by that is none of these talk about how traders behave in these markets. While it's also quite often the case that uh, there is very asymmetric behavior in markets so everyone wants to buy nobody wants to sell so there's a very negative aggregate supply of the asset so this is the aspect that is not mentioned in these definitions but the one that we will be focusing in our first class of models and now if these definitions are not clear enough let us look at a few examples of bubbles as i said most of these are modern classics so i'm pretty sure you've heard a dozen times about all of those no discussion is complete without uh, mentioning of Enron, which is maybe a synonym for a bubble for a lot of the people, even though a lot of stuff has happened since then. So it was a tech company, uh, no, sorry, not tech, energy company, uh, with huge growth in the 90s and then drastic drop in 2000s. So it was around the same time as dot-com bubble. I, I am not... 100% sure if it's connected with the dot-com bubble uh, since it's an energy company not a tech company but it might be now another of course prominent recent example is the US housing bubble <coughs> where um, the housing prices basically boomed a lot in early 2000s in the first half of 2000s so this is a graph from Wikipedia, which they also took from somewhere else, which uh, shows you the home price index adjusted for inflation. And you see it was more or less the same throughout the century, and it drastically went up in 2000s, uh, which was not supported by building costs, bond yields, or surge in population. So this was the bubble that basically kick-started the Great Recession that all of you, all of us, have lived through and survived. Another even more recent example is the bubble that we've already mentioned in this course, which was the Bitcoin slash globally cryptocurrency bubble. So this is the chart of the price of Bitcoin. You see, just like Investopedia says, a sudden surge in the price followed by a sharp drop. So that was a thing, and nobody mentioned Bitcoin ever since. Um, so these are all very trivial, very household examples of bubbles. And I'm pretty sure you were all familiar with those. So here is one that you may not have necessarily heard about, just a slightly more exotic one. So in the again in the early 2000s, the price of uranium was actually upwards trending by a lot. Uh, it says I have a network crap. Am I live? I'm not live.
Okay, I think we might be back live, but I'm not sure about that. Let me check. The slide changes, and it does not. Okay, yeah, okay, we're we're back live. My internet was choking for a second. Uh, why do I have twenty six viewers? That's a bug. I'll just type in chat, refresh, if stream problems, just in case. Okay, so back to our bubbles. In early 2006, we had a, um, what you might call a uranium bubble. So the price was really, really trending upwards, and here blue is the nominal price and red is the real price, so inflation adjusted. Uh, with uh, with a peg in early 80s. And this bubble may have been jump-started by one incident in 2006 or late 2006, although you can see it was in the middle of this price of this um, trend. And what happened is that in late 2006, one of the mines in Canada was uh, flooded. And this mine was uh, containing the largest known undeveloped reserves of of uranium meaning that well when this news when this piece of news bro broke out everyone expected a huge shortage of supply of uranium so you can see there was a lot of excessive demand just like with toilet paper last month although probably not in not in Copenhagen but in some parts of the world so there was a perceived shortage of supply, and the price actually increased by a lot. But then eventually um, there was a drop. So it dropped back again, and you see that it was, it did end up being significantly higher than before the incident. Uh, but so there may have been a decrease in supply, but it seems um, there was some bubble in that market. For a short while. Okay, so let us get to our theories. We will look at a few theories, we will not get into any of them in great detail, so we'll just skim over a lot of those. And we'll start with herding models. So what I listed in the syllabus before yesterday was uh, this paper by Smith and Sorensen from 2000. When I uh, revisited it, I realized that it's actually maybe quite heavy for our purposes, a little too heavy. So apologies to those of you who have attempted to read it in advance. I have uh, changed the reference yesterday to this other article by same authors from 2011. So this is a Palgrave Economic Dictionary entry, and it is basically a retelling, a summary of their original article, just outlining the main points through simpler examples. So, I will be following this retelling for, uh, for today. And if you want to go deeper, you are encouraged to go to that, to this uh, dictionary entry. And then, if you want to know more, you can revisit the original article, but you don't want to... You don't, you don't need to read this article, necessarily. Okay, so what's the idea? What's the idea behind herding? I already told you that herding is uh, basically ignoring private information in favor of relying on the public information, on this wisdom of the crowd. Now there can be different kinds of herding, so it may be the efficient response to new information, meaning that if we all know that, um, well, suddenly there is a real decrease of supply of uranium but the market prices for some reason do not reflect it the dealers quotes do not reflect it then we all want to buy if we expect a shortage of toilet paper and market prices have not changed then we want to stockpile on toilet paper so it might be not the efficient but let's say rational response to new information <clears throat> Although both of these are rational, so efficient is correct here. So the alternative is that it is an inefficient result of a certain decision-making process that we will go through. 
that this model describes. So it is still rational. It will still be rational to ignore private information in favor of public information, but it, it will not be efficient. So a lot more efficient outcomes could have been obtained if all agents pulled their information together. So basically, I want to use herding as one of the interpretations of bubbles, where just everyone goes to buy, and that's it. Uh, there is a more particular uh, example of herding, which is basically momentum trading strategy in financial markets. Momentum trading strategy tells that uh, you want to buy stocks that are upwards trending, and you want to sell stocks that are downwards trending. So you want to pull in your order with the current uh, dominant force in the market. When the price is upwards trending, it's likely there are more buyers than sellers, so you want to buy as well, uh, which, which is an example of a herd, of a herding behavior. And positive feedback trading is a kind of a similar thing. There were, there was a kind of a, a small wave, or that you can call a herd, of uh, articles on herding in 1992. So there were two of those, and they started a small literature. So this literature, this paper by Smith and Sorensen, is one of the contributions, one of the later contributions to that literature. Uh, so, but we will basically use this as a as an illustration of all of the herding models as, as an illustration of the main driving force in these herding models. So, so how does it work? In this model, agents arrive at the market sequentially and each of, them, each of them needs to make a decision as soon as they arrive. Now every agent gets some private signal when they arrive and they also get to observe decisions of all the previous agents. So I have some idea of what the of what is the right thing to do, and I also see what everyone else do, did before me. But what I cannot see is I cannot see what was their private signal. So it is uh, it is my problem to try to understand whether traders before me acted like that because they had private information to behave the way they did, uh, private information that incentivized them to behave the way they did. Or they were basing their information on decisions of agents even before those, or even before them. So this is the inference problem that every agent faces, and we will look into it in slightly more detail. So as I said, the ideal outcome here would be to just pull everyone private's information to find the optimal decision, the efficient decision, and uh, the efficient price in the market. But, of course, uh, we already saw it when we talked about transparency, and this is a relatively trivial insight. If you have private information, you want to exploit it to get the profit, right? Because it gives you an edge in the market. It gives you a chance to make a decision better than everyone else, to outplay everyone else. So you do not want to reveal this private information. Well, this ideal outcome is an absolutely unrealistic benchmark for us. There is no way we can ever do this. So we will look at how sequential decision-making performs. And we will see that it leads to some artifacts. In this um, decision-making structure, when everyone just acts in sequence, based on the information available to them, those who are the first to come to the market will not have a lot of um, sample points to make their inferences from, so they will not have, will, they will not see a lot of decisions of other agents. So they will have to make decisions based on their private information. Private is missing here. But then as time goes by, there is an accumulation of public information. So more decisions uh, are observed. And as there, uh, as enough public information is accumulated, people might start disregarding their private information because they think that public information is a lot more informative. So even if their guts tell them to sell, but everyone before them bought, they will think that buying is the best thing to do. And as I said, this is 
fully rational. So they optimize, uh, they maximize their expected utility, their expected profit, given the information available to them. Okay. And this, um, yeah, this, this results in herding behavior, and this results in informational cascade, where just a few pieces of information determine everyone's choice. So everyone makes their decisions based on the, f on the very few uh, private signals. And this is the inefficient part, because these few private signals may be incorrect. Okay, a little more math. In this model we have a state, which you can think of the fundamental value. We'll call it V, as usual. And we'll say that it's binary. It's either low or high. Now this is a dynamic model, so we have many periods, 1, 2, 3, etc. In every period, an individual arrives at the market and needs to make a decision, dt. So we'll say that it's a binary decision 0 or 1, where 1 means invest in the asset, buy the asset, and 0 means pass, or you can think that 0 means sell. So the agent's payoffs are, uh, if we interpret 0 as uh, not buying the asset, then the payoff of doing so is zero. Payoff from buying the asset is the fundamental value, so either low or high, minus the price. So we'll say that M is the mid quote, the price, and we'll say that this price is fixed. And yeah, it doesn't make sense that agents are buying at the mid quote. You can put ask price here, nothing will change. So let's move to beliefs. The uncertainty in this model is captured by this um, fundamental value v, just as usual. So we have binary v, high or low. So let us um, represent all beliefs as probabilities that uh, value is high. So pt is the probability that value is high conditional on something. qt and rt are also beliefs, so they will also be the probabilities um, of value being high conditional relevant information now we will need to juggle quite a number of different beliefs in this model firstly we want to look at the agent's prior belief so this is the belief with which the agent arrives to the market and we will label that as pt and the way you should think about it is there is some public prior so everyone agrees that in the absence of any information, the probability of V being high is um, one half, 50-50. But then every agent receives their private signal, and this is what um, enters their prior belief PT. So PT is the belief uh, one half updated based upon the private signal. Now the important part here is that this private signal is actually informative of V, so it is relevant to all the other traders. Everyone would like to know what this private signal is. It is not some kind of idiosyncratic uh, valuation of agents. Um, it is not agents idiosyncratic valuation for the asset. It is the information about the true value. So agent arrives at the market with belief PT. Now another belief that we want to consider is the, uh, so to say, market belief, which we will label as QT. And this is the analog of market valuation. So what we usually called mu T, but this is belief, not the valuation. So what this is, this is, um, once again, public prior, one half, updated based on the decisions of all the past agents. <clears throat> so this is the belief you, you would have if you were, say, a market maker in this market. You do not get any private information, but you get to see what everyone does. So you get to have this market um, belief QT. 
in here, just assuming that agents' actions are actually informative of their privately, prior beliefs, of their private signals. So QT does encompass some information. And so our agent at time t needs to decide whether to buy the asset or not, and they base their, this decision on what I will call posterior belief, RT. And this posterior belief just combines the information from the agent's private signal and the past agent's decisions. So equivalently, it combines information from both PT and QT. And um, I'm not giving you explicit formulas here, but all beliefs are, of course, calculated using Bayes' rule. Because... Um, because we're doing economics. All of economics uses base rule. Okay. So the agent behaves optimally, meaning that the agent will choose to invest if and only if his expected utility from doing so is high enough, meaning if he assigns a large enough weight to the asset value actually being high. So you can compute this uh, threshold belief R bar and it will be equal to this fraction in our setting. It's not a difficult task, so I will not be uh, doing it here on the blackboard. Now, if we use Bayes' rule to compute RT, to actually see what is the information contained in agent's prior belief and past agent's actions, how do they combine together, you will get this. I am a bit undecided on whether I should do this derivation, but I feel like in my execution it will confuse you more than, uh, than it will clarify things, so I will skip it, and I will ask you to take this expression for granted. <clears throat> so combining these two observations, combining these two observations, we get that conditional on public information QT, conditional on some public belief QT, the agent will invest if and only if the agent's private prior belief is above some threshold p bar t. And you can compute this p bar t from the cutoff error bar, from the cutoff for the posterior, as follows. So this expression here is just the rearranged version of this expression with rt equal to r bar. So this is all relatively clear. The agent will invest if his private information suggests doing so, if his private signal is relatively uh, strong. And this is com giving some fixed public information. So and one thing to note here is that... It, one thing to note here is that I did it incorrectly. So you should have, I think, this to the power minus one. So it should be the inverse of this. Now that I think of it. And once you do it this way, you will notice that um, P bar T is decreasing in QT. So my investment cutoff is decreasing in public uh, belief. The idea behind this is the more favorable information I infer from other agents' decisions, the less confident I need to be on my own to invest into the asset, right? So the information in PT and QT combined should be good enough for me to invest. So if the public information is good enough, my private information can be bad enough and I will still invest. And vice versa. If public information is very bad, then I will only invest if my private belief is uh, very, very high. So if my PT is very, very high. Okay, why do we need it? Uh, if we impose some distribution on PT, so recall that this prior belief PT is um, based on some private signals. And private signals have some distributions conditional on true states. And what we assume in this paper is that um, you always have some imperfect private signal. 
and uh, you can never perfectly infer the state from this private signal. So your PT will be somewhere between 0 and 1. And now let us consider the case when this prior belief is even bounded. So it always lies inside some interval from P lower bars to P upper bar. So your private information is informative, but it is never too informative. So it does not bring your belief PT too close to 0 or 1. Then if this is the case, if support of these private signals is bounded, what you can do is you can arrive to such, uh, such a public belief QT that it will be optimal to invest regardless of um, your private signal, which is this case. Or it will be optimal to never invest, again, regardless of your private signal. So I guess we can draw it like this. So if this is your space of uh, PT from 0 to 1, your private belief can be, so it's centered, say centered around 1, 2. It can be in this region. It's difficult to do uh, this with a mouse. I'm not sure what this ECG is supposed to be. But this is a P lower bar. This is P upper bar. So highest and lowest private beliefs that you can conceivably have. So my point on the slide was that your threshold for investment in a given period can be outside this interval. So if, if the public information QT is so good that your PT bar is below P lower bar, then you will invest... Uh, let me just draw it this way, otherwise it takes too long. So you invest whenever PT is above PT upper bar, and you will invest for any value of your private information. So you will completely ignore your private information, and you will always invest. And vice versa, if public information is just too bad, then your threshold for investment is very, very high. In which case, you will never invest regardless of your private information. This is the idea there. And what does this mean? This means exactly that a herd arises. So once we arrive at one such QT, then agent at time t ignores the private information, and his behavior is fully determined by the public information, QT. But then what does this mean for the agent at t plus 1? Now this agent at t plus 1, when he looks at the history, when he looks at past agent's decisions, this agent can compute what was the optimal way for previous agents to behave. In particular, this agent at t plus 1 would understand, would, com would compute that it was optimal for agent t to ignore his private information completely and just act based on uh, QT. But what this means is that no new information was added to the public information, was added to QT at time T, which means that QT plus 1 will be equal to QT. This, in turn, means that once again we are in one of these cases, because the public belief did not change, the public information did not change. Which means that it is once again the case that the public information overpowers private information and so decision at t plus 1 will also do not depend, will also not depend on t plus 1's private information, so it will not be uninformative for, a, uh, for future agents, 
So once again, a herd begins. And of course, the challenging part of this reasoning is to say that, oops, is that you can arrive to such a belief QT. But this is something that is shown in the paper. This is something that we will not go into. The important part is that such QT will be based on a finite number of private signals. So on average, you will get such a QT after only a finite number of private signals. Which does mean that they may be incorrect with some probability. That the herd will go in their own direction. So there will be a herd in, in which nobody invests, even though the asset value is uh, high. Or vice versa. A herd in which everyone invests, even though asset value is low. And of course, the probability of an incorrect herd is, by definition, lower than the probability of correct herd, because these private signals are more likely to be correct than not. But the chance of an incorrect herd arising is positive. So once again, a few incorrect signals can be enough to set off a herd. And we get, we arrive to a case in which a small amount of information just cascades through the system. Everyone bases their decisions around the very same signals and all, all of the private information of future traders is completely ignored. Question from Frederick. Is it possible that the threshold value PT bar lies within the upper and lower bound? And then private information matters. Yes, of course. So, um, if we, for example, no, not this window. Let me find it. This one, this one. For some reason, it always chooses the wrong one. If we look at the very first trader, then they will not have access to any public information. Which means that QT will be just equal to the public prior, so it will be at one half. And then this first agent will have to act based on their private signal. So if their P is above one half, they will invest, and if it's below one half, then they will not invest. And uh, yeah, QT starts from one half, and for some limited time, it will be uh, within this interval. Not necessarily limited, so it there might even be um, it might be this way that QT just always oscillates within this interval, but on average it will leave the interval uh, in finite time. And actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the slides, so I'll say it this way. Um, in Smith, and, so this uh, what I just described is the case of uh, so the usual herding that was considered in all the '92 papers. Uh, Smith and Sorensen consider a more general model in which more things can arise. So, in particular, what they show is that there might be some scenario in which QT becomes completely uninformative from some point onwards. So the opposite to a herd can arise, uh, which is a scenario in which everyone completely ignores public information and only uses their private information to make their decisions, which is once again inefficient. So this cannot happen in the simple, simple model that I set up, but if you enrich this model a little bit, this is something that can also happen. And they call all of these the pathological outcomes, hence the title. So in this model, every agent is rational. So we saw that they do maximize their expected profit conditional on all the information that is available to them. But together they may seem silly, stupid. 
all of their information together is really very precise, but they just fail to aggregate it. And really the, the main friction that impedes information aggregation in these settings is that actions are just not informative enough of, of private signals. So agents do not con actions, decisions do not contain enough information um, or actions are too noisy of a signals of private information. Okay, so if this discussion was not uh, clear enough, I also have a computational example here, just for particular numbers. Uh, so I take a particular stream of signals, and I show you how a herd arises in this case. So I will not go through this example right now, or ever, but it is in the slides if you're interested, so you're, in you're welcome to uh, look at it. So a few more comments. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I did just say the second one, that a state of permanent uncertainty is possible, in which everyone ignores public information altogether. But one more comment is that these incorrect herds only occur if the distribution of PT is bounded. So if we go back here, if the distribution of private signals is unbounded, it is such that, uh, I forgot which color it was. It is such that private belief can be literally anything. You can be arbitrarily informed about the true value of the asset. Then the herds do not actually arise, right? QT can never be outside this blue interval, because the blue interval is the whole belief space. And if you think about it, this might be a very a kind of a weak but still an argument in favor of informed trading or insider trading even because insiders are people who are arbitrarily well informed right so here the whole problem stems from everyone being symmetrically uninformed but if you allow some people to trade who are actually who have a lot of information who might have a lot of information, then you can break down the herd. And uh, decisions will always converge to the efficient action. But this mirrors our usual argument that uh, more informed trading improves price discovery. So this relates to that. Now, a small note on terminology. So I've used two terms without properly defining them herd and cascade they are subtly different and are not exactly equivalent so a herd means that there is action convergence so that everyone does the same thing from some point onwards everyone starts buying and everyone starts selling a cascade means uh, the convergence of public belief so that all the same bits of information begin cascading uh, throughout the, the model, throughout the market, throughout the society. Uh, the two happen more or less uh, in the same cases. So when you have a herd, you do have a cascade, I think. So th these, are two, these two are not completely equivalent, and I keep forgetting which one of them does not imply which. But... Um, this is just to point out that the two are slightly different, but the distinction is not super important for our purposes. So I will not be too mad at you if you confuse the two. Now, just a little more on herding before we go uh, on the break. What happens if we allow the price to be flexible? Because part of the problem in the model that we just had in this simple toy model was that we just fixed the price at some level, and we said that it does not adjust. But, you know, that's, that goes against literally everything that you've ever learned in economics. The idea is prices must reflect this private information, and uh, prices are set by somebody, by some agents, so why should they be fixed? So let us look at what happens if we add a price into our model. 
And for the remainder of uh, herding discussion, I will be following this survey by Bixin, Dani, and Sharma from 2000. I've also uh, added it to, 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 the, to the reading list. So let us set up a very simple model as before. We still have this asset of some unknown value v. Each trader arrives with some uh, prior PT, which is based on their private signals. And uh, with probability 1 minus pi, our trader is rational, uh, just like we just considered them. With probability pi, the trader is a noise trader, our favorite um, uninformed noise guys, who buy, sell, or abstain with equal probabilities. And we put a risk-neutral dealer in the middle, uh, who sets a competitive bid and ask price. And at this point, I want to ask you, what will happen in this model? So can you tell me, will there be herding in such model? So will herding be possible in such model? So give me a yes or a no in chat, and I give you a few seconds to think. We got four no's and one yes. Uh, would would anyone care? Would anyone care to uh, say why? Not why is and yes, but why is and why will there be or not be hurting? Uh, due to noise traders, hmm. can that be? Oh yeah, actually you're right. So with with no, noise traders will always um, just trade randomly. They will never actually herd. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good answer. So I I I went for a more I guess teachable answer. If you look closely at this model, it is exactly Gloston Milgram model. Just the one on this slide. And there is kind of no, no herd in there. The prices end up being efficient. And at any given point in time, the price is set at such level that both ask and bid, uh, sorry, that b both buy and uh, sell orders are, do happen with positive probability. So, but this, this was a very, very simple model. So as it turns out, if you just put a few a little bit more complexity onto it, then you might have a few herds. Then herding might be possible in it. So one example of such a model is Avery and Zemsky. But uh, so I I retell it the way it is presented in uh, Bixin, Dani, and Sharma's survey. So you do not need to look at the original paper. So suppose that the fundamental value of our asset is 0, 1 half, or 1. If the value is 1 half, this is perfectly revealed to every trader by, the, by their private signal. So here I introduce these private signals explicitly. If value is 0 or 1, low or high, not neutral, then each trader still receives a signal, which is informative, but it may be of a different degree of informativeness. So you have proportion mu of the traders that have perfect information. They do perfectly learn whether the value is high or low. They are our favorite insiders. The remaining traders are uh, have a bit of a noisy information. So they are not noise traders. They are still uh, re um, profit maximizing traders. They just don't have as good of information as they do. So after a good signal, their belief is PT is somewhere between one half and one. And after a bad signal, uh, their belief would be 1 minus this. And to add even more uncertainty on here, we do not really know what is this proportion of the informed traders. So it can be high or low. 
And as it turns out, what happens here is, well, before we go there, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in this model. And not just in terms of volatility or variance, but in terms of the layers of uncertainty. So for the market maker, you have three levels of uncertainty and actually kind of four, but I didn't have place for the fourth one. So first of all, the market maker does not really know whether um, there was any piece of news where there, there was a news event or there was none. Then conditional on the event, it's not, of course, known whether this was good or bad. The market maker does not know that. Then, as usual, the market maker does not know whether he uh, trades with uh, informed trader or the less informed trader. So this is the missing layer here. And finally, the, the market maker does not know how many informed traders there are. So whether the economy on average is well informed or not. And the argument is, herds can happen in this model. So in our very basic model, price mechanism worked as a screen device. It, um, it did ensure that the high types always bought and the low types always sold. So as I said, the prices are always set such that both buy and sell orders are possible. But now the dealer uh, just cannot extract enough information from, um, from trades. So in this case, mispricing is possible, at least on a temporary scale. So what they first say is that there can be non-speculative bubbles, uh, which happen, for example, if all traders know V, so everyone knows that the asset is worth a lot, but the market maker does not, then, of course, all traders will buy, just because they know that the asset is fundamentally underpriced. They know the fundamental value, they know that it is above the current market price. So they will be willing to uh, buy the asset. They will kind of instrumentally pull on the decision to buy. And you can see, you can perceive it as a herd, but it is a response to information that the market maker does not have. Now, I, I'm not sure if I can uh, go, if I can subscribe by this view, because you can if you call this a bubble, you can also have these kinds of bubbles in Gloucester Milgram model. Right? Nothing new happens here. In Gloucester Milgram, once again, if uh, you have a lot of informed traders coming to the market in a row and they all know the asset is good, they will all buy, right? So it's, it's the same kind of herd that happens in there. You do not need all of these layers of uncertainty to generate that. So the informative part here is the speculative bubble. And it is described to happen in such a way uh, as um, when the economy overall is uninformed, so there are very few well-informed traders, but traders themselves do not know this mu. So traders do look at, at public information, they do look at what the other traders did and what the price is today, and they think that the past order flow is more informative than it is. They think that average trader in the past was more informed than they actually is. And this leads every trader to overweigh public information compared to their private signal. And this leads to this kind of speculative bubble or herding. Now it might be the case that these two interact in uh, some way and this produces extra results. I'm not 100% sure about that. But uh, the speculative bubble is the interesting part of this paper. And once again, I have some appendix on here where um, you can see a bit of a numerical simulation on what can happen in such a model. But if, if I remember correctly, it was a long while since I looked at it, uh, this is, okay, it, it is written here. This is a non-speculative bubble. So again, it's the same kind of herding or bubble that can happen in Gloucester Milgram model as well. Okay, well, we'll stop for a break here.
And after that, we will talk just a tiny bit more about herding, and then we will move to Abro Bruno Maya model. So I will see you after the break. <laughs> 